Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship today at the Pleasant Hill Community Church, United Church of Christ. I'm Pastor John, and it certainly is my privilege to welcome you to worship everybody that's here in the house today and all that are joining us live on our service on Facebook. We're glad to have you. In the United Church of Christ, we say, no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey. And I'm gonna add this morning, or whatever you're going through right now, you are welcome here. And we truly believe this place belongs to God, it belongs to all of us, and God is bringing us together in the power of friendship and fellowship and community and the power of God's love. It's a wonderful day for worship. It may be getting wet a little bit later, uh, Maybe we'll get a chance to find out, but I think our roof is good. I don't think we're going to have any leaks or anything today. So we look forward to it. My thanks, as always, to everybody who helps make worship possible. Diana Riggs for planning our music. The Chimers are here today, accompanied by Sally Freisinger, who's again with us. Thank you so much. Our choral support singers are here. Holly Nelson is our liturgist today. And I'm sorry that her name is not in the bulletin. We had a little, we weren't exactly sure, but she is here today and will do a great job, of course. Don, thank you for our technology. I just want to remind you all that in only a couple of weeks now, it's going to be time for the annual church picnic. And we're thankful to the Dobsons for hosting it at their farm again this year. We need to get signups. And you've been seeing that, and you'll see Virginia was out uh, in the hall this morning, and she'll be back out in Boyce Hall right after worship. Let's get signed up, and let's get planned for a great fall picnic. And the last thing I want to say before it's time for worship is that we had our first pastoral and congregational conversation about 2020. Oh, my goodness, the year that was. And we had a great time on Thursday afternoon this last week, coming to share what it's been like to go through COVID and the, the, the losses that we've experienced, what it's been like to not be able to come back together as a church, what it was like to lose our pastor. And, and, and in such a, a difficult time, we had a great time sharing, and we ended up finding some hope for the future as well. We're gonna have another conversation if you'd like to participate Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. So that those who might have commitments during the day can have an opportunity to come. So I certainly invite you to come and join us in that. We're gonna have good music today, we're gonna have good singing. We're gonna to read together, pray together, listen to God's word together. It's a great day to be in God's house.
come into this household of God that we might all listen to God's word and discern the wisdom that comes only from God. How can we discover such wisdom? Reverence for God is the beginning of wisdom when we choose to live according to God's will and plan. God will give to each of us a wise and discerning heart. God fills us with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. We have come praise and music in our hearts. Jesus is here in our midst as living bread. We want to be nourished and strengthened that we may remain with him. Jesus is so close to us that we can taste his presence. Praise the Lord, the Lord of God's compassion and mercy. Praise the Lord. this time to look into our words, thoughts, and deeds. We confess that we fool ourselves into believing that we possess all of the knowledge that we need. As we go from place to place, we try to block you out, even though we say we want to hear your word and speak with you. We fail to see we are always in your presence. We stray, seeking other gods, whose ways may be easy, but cannot show us the ways of love and truth. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we might live each day according to your will and plan for us and for your world. Help us to discern your wisdom that we might live eternally Hear these words of assurance and God's mercy. In God's wisdom and compassion, we receive grace that we might live anew, unburdened by the obstacles and pride of the past. Continue to feast on the living bread, which is given to us each day. Give thanks to God, who lifts us up with the gift of forgiveness. Amen. I feel like the announcer who gets to say, and now, 
for the moment you've all been waiting for. We have uh, the privilege this morning of hearing a report uh, from our summer camp, and we've got a distinguished group of speakers, and we've got a couple of pretty distinguished leaders that I want to recognize. Karen Charbonnet and um, um, Clarice Mitchell have kept during the long COVID months contact with our children and youth and tried to keep Zoom going. And the first time I got to meet this group was way back in the cold months of January on Zoom when I got to attend class one day. But it sure is a lot better to see them in place. So I want to ask you all to come and stand up here. And Karen, you're going to begin. Uh, we want you to be able to be in front of the iPad there because that's what uh, is broadcasting. So when you speak, come right here and let them see your face real well. You can take your mask off. Ms. Okay. Karen. I know everybody is very, very glad to see the children. I sure am in person. And look how tall they are. They're beautiful. So they want to talk a little bit with you about their summer camp experience. And they're so appreciative for the support that everyone gave them that they could have this experience. So I'll introduce them. Aiden, Morgan, Rory, Nate, Olivia, and Caleb. And they're going to take time right now I'll give him the mic, so you can take the mask. You can take the mask. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, paying for us for to let us go to camp. Um, I made a lot of new friends there, and I painted rocks. I had a fun time going tubing, but I flipped over whenever I went tubing. So um, I also learned how to sit in the tube the correct way. <laughs> and um, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, I'm Morgan. Um, this year, I was more aware of the fact that I only had like six and a half days with my campmates, so I liked taking time to get to know them and bond with them and just like appreciate everybody. And on the last night, um, it was raining really hard and it was still like light out a little bit. And um, everybody was on the porch where there were like rocking chairs. So we were all huddled up there, but since it was the last night and we were just like excited, um, me and my friend Abby were like, whatever, and we just ran out in our clothes and we like played in the rain and then all the other younger campers came with us because we were like one of the oldest and um, it was really fun. Uh, and I learned to never take anything for granted and appreciate everything. Um, and I'm very lucky to have this experience, so thank you. Um, I'm Rory, and I want to say thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to go to camp. It's always the highlight of my year and summer, and I think my favorite part of camp was the Virginia Creeper Trail. Um, it's always my highlight of camp, and I think this was my sixth year going, um, but it was the best, and I was able to go tubing and help um, actually lead the other campers down the river. Um, I met a lot of great people, and the same friends that I have met in previous years. Um, in my first year at camp, actually, they were all in my cabin, which was great. Um, it was a great opportunity to not be on my phone. I wasn't on my phone for that whole week, which was <laughs> great. Um, and it taught me to kind of, there's other things besides phone. There's people right in front of me. Um, they were, I had a great time, and thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go in the middle. It's already good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for putting a 
us all be able to go to camp and I really like meeting new people and I like going to archery and tubing. Cool. First year for Nate this year. Good job. Um, thank you for letting us go to camp this year. It was very fun. We had great counselors. We got to go tubing, hiking, swimming. We got a Polar Express. And yeah. Come on over, Kayla. We want to be able to see you. There you go. Um, thank you for allowing us to go to camp and paying for it. Um, I had really fun um, tubing and going kayaking, which was my first time. Um, the Virginia Creeper Trail was definitely one of my favorites. But uh, yeah, thank you. Again, I want to thank Miss Karen and I want to thank Clarice. Thank you, church. Pray for this crew. They promise they're, they're coming back. You're going to see more uh, plays. You're going to hear more reading. You're going to uh, see their faces a lot more. And I think we should give them a scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Thank you so much, Holly. And may God bless the reading and the hearing of God's holy word this day. It was way back in the olden times of 1980. Now that was a long time before any of these youth were even thought about. Maybe that seems like it was back in the good old days for some of the rest of us. But there was quite a controversy that was stirred up in my home denomination, the Southern Baptists, about the kinds of prayers that God can hear. Now, I don't think anybody I ever knew would accuse God of being hard of hearing. God hears every prayer that we ever utter or think, I believe. But there were those who were trying to define the prayers that God would hear and answer. Now, that's not a business I was comfortable with, even back in those days. But there was a president of our Southern Baptist Convention who went on record as saying, God Almighty does not hear the prayers of a Jew. Boy, oh boy, was there a brouhaha over that one. And rightfully so. If you can believe it, it was Dr. Jerry Falwell. <laughs> Wait, that Jerry, the senior patriarch of the Falwell clan that founded Liberty University as a bastion of evangelical conservatism, it was Dr. Falwell 
who got together with Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum of the American Jewish Committee to issue a joint statement that said this, God loves everyone alike. And here's the cry of any sincere person who calls on him. America is and needs to remain a pluralistic republic. And we must never allow our differing theological principles to separate us as Americans who love and respect each other as a united people. Now, I will be honest, I never thought I would wish for the likes of Dr. Jerry Falwell to return and speak some sense into our dialogue today. I really don't want to focus this morning on religious fundamentalism or on controversial personalities. What I want to do is to lift up one of the most poignant moments in Jesus' ministry when he addressed the subject of prayer by giving us a parable that has endured for these 2,000 years of the church. Now, you know what the form of a parable is, and if you don't, uh, you, uh, many of you have studied uh, the shape of a parabola, okay? Flashing me back to my geometry days, we know a parabola is drawn, you know, kind of like this. We might call it an arc. A parable, a story, is something that takes two things and places them side by side. And you consider how these things illustrate a life lesson. The parable carries over meaning from one to the other. And so this parable today, we ask, what do we learn about the way we should live as Jesus followers, when we hear this parable, this story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. First of all, we should know these characters are sharply drawn and they're chosen to illustrate the commonly held conceptions of the society of the day. Everybody has conceptions and preconceptions. That was certainly true in the time of Jesus. The Pharisee at that time, and probably this would be true today, was considered to be a very righteous and religious person. Spent his life trying to learn and follow the rules that he felt God wanted him to keep. He devoted his life to keeping all those rules. And we note that he was a very generous giver to his church. 10%, a tenth, or we sometimes call that the tithe of all of his income. Now, we'd probably be quite happy to have him as a member of Pleasant Hill Community Church, don't you think? <laughs> Come on in, help us. He's a good worker, he gives a good offering. Come on in. The tax collector over here on the other hand was kind of like the villain in the old time silent movies. You know, whenever the villain comes onto the scene, usually to tie a helpless damsel down to the railroad track or something like that, the crowd was encouraged to, to boo and to hiss whenever the bad guy came on. Tax collectors were not the good guys of the day. They were not held in high esteem in that society. We at least get an idea of that, don't we? What if you were to leave today and you get back home and there's somebody waiting on you? They give you a knock and they say, hi, I'm from the IRS and I'm here to audit you. <laughs> so the initial scene is set up. And the crowd is set to favor one of these characters over the other. Jesus then asks us to imagine them coming to pray. And like all great parables, the outcome is a twist. It's a surprise. And that's where the lesson lies. The Pharisee's prayer is lengthy. And it's quite self-centered 
God, I thank you that I am not like all of these other people. They're thieves, they're rogues, they're adulterers. And some of them are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. He mentions God once and himself four times. Now that might be a bit of a problem right there. But he also manages to look down his self-righteous nose at the tax collector. Thank God I am not like him. The Pharisees just made an assertion that resembles that of the preacher with which I began the sermon. By the way, Dr. Falwell was not the one who made the statement. He was the one who helped correct it. Surely God will never hear the prayer of a person like that. I'm so glad that I am so good and that God is most assuredly pleased with me. <laughs> now, you may already be able to figure out that the story is not heading toward a favorable conclusion for the Pharisee. The prayer of the tax collector, who is the stand-in for all the sinful people of the world, all the ne'er-do-wells of the time. The prayer of this tax collector is quite simple by comparison. God, be merciful to me. A sinner. And that's it. Short, sweet, and to the point. Which is a good prayer primer, by the way. If you're going to pray, you can keep it short. Make it simple. And just get to the point. But in that brief sentence, this tax collector did at least three very important things. Number one, he acknowledged and invoked the name of God. We may call God by different names or titles. That's okay. But there is some kind of basic recognition of that which is different from us. Someone or some force or energy that is greater than our lives. To be honest, God, the English word, is just a name that we've come up with. God has many names in the Bible. And God, I am sure, has many names and many faces in our world. Secondly, he trusted that this God was merciful and compassionate. Lots of times in the scripture, we hear uh, that God's uh, we hear of God's heart. We hear of God's mercy. We hear of God's compassion and watchfulness and care. Personally, I think the tax collector is on very solid theological ground here. God's basic desire for all of us is for good. Take a quick read through the very first chapter of the Bible and just note how many times God says, that's good. But finally, the, the, this tax collector fully realized that there were times in his life that he was in way over his head. The word sinner kind of puts us off sometimes when we hear it. Oh, sinner. Oh, it, it, I don't like that word that much. We've allowed the word to be captured by people who want to use the term and often who want to pick their Bible up with it and beat us over the head in order to belittle us and berate us. Ah, oh, you're a sinner, just like the Pharisee was praying. But you know what? That's not the way the term is used in the scripture. Sin is a word that means to wander off the path. To miss whatever it is you're aiming for. Like one of my basketball shots, okay? I miss more than I hit, right? Getting yourself lost in the maze of life and the choices that have to be made. 
most of us can identify with the sinking feeling that comes from being genuinely lost in an unfamiliar place. As a good old country boy from West Tennessee, the first time I ever came to Nashville was at the age of 16. I was kind of like Gomer Pyle at that point, confronted with all of the interstates and the overpasses and all the variety of street names. I just kind of stood there and went, well, golly! It, I'd never seen anything like that. And so, of course, I proceeded to get lost. Lost in the city, and I had a very uncomfortable hour or so as I drove around and finally was able to find my way back out. Feeling lost and bewildered, that's not a comfortable place to be. And life is like that. We make wrong turns. We make poor decisions. And we wonder how we're ever going to find our way back. And that's what sin is. That, that's just what it means. So it's the supposed bad guy of the story, the tax collector, who knows who he is and knows what he's done. And he just asks God for God's help. In the end of the story, Jesus says, guess who went home with his life put right? Guess which one of these guys got it? I can guarantee this morning that there is at least one prayer that God always hears and answers. It's the prayer that's modeled on this one. It's known in the ancient Christian tradition as the Jesus Prayer. It's been prayed by millions of saints that have gone before us. And I think we would do well to use it too. One of my favorite writers, Anne Lamott, in her book, Traveling Mercies, tells about learning from a friend what she called the two best prayers I know. And I think they keep this prayer in mind. Help me, help me, help me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are pretty much in the spirit of the tax collector, I'd say. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. others. After that sermon, I better keep it pretty short. Um, but you will see on page six, the um, folks that are on our prayer list, and I have one addition this morning. Let us pray with Joan and Jim Gettings for their grandson, Emmett Brown, who is 17 years old. Emmett is in for some uh, treatment and some rehabilitation for a while. And so we want to pray for he and his family. His parents are Audrey and Jay Emmett, and his brother and sister are Ava and Connor. Pray for Emmett. You see that we have been praying with Dick, who's recovering in the wellness center, with Esther, who is undergoing cancer treatment, with Tom, who's here with us today, but continuing medical issues, 
for Bob, whose twin brother died earlier, for Jeannie recovering at the Wellness Center. Jean is here with us today, continuing to deal with the after effects of COVID. Kathy is at home. We're grateful for her recovery, praying for Diana and Ron, as well as Jeffrey, and also with Joyce. I am quite certain there are other prayers that you've got today. And in a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to be silent. And that's the time for each of us to pray. We think our prayers, we voice our prayers, whatever's, whatever's on your heart. Let's lift these before. We do thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. Whether we say them out loud or whether we hold them in our hearts or even think them in our minds. Also, we know that your word teaches us when we don't have the words to pray, that you understand that too. So today we do pray for each of these we've named. Every situation, whether it's those in treatment, those who are recovering, those who are facing long time illness, we pray for those who have lost people that they love. We pray for our world. We pray for the people in Afghanistan. We pray for the people in Haiti. We pray for all of the places in America where people are in trouble and they're hungry. And in many cases, people are dying. Help us to know what we can do and help us to take action. And God, as we lift our prayers today, we thank you that you hear the prayers of our hearts. And just now, as we pause in silence, listen for the prayers of your people. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer as our Savior has taught us. Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we spend a moment now reflecting on the material giving that we have given, may we reflect also on those things that we don't often perceive as gifts that we bring to God. Our gentleness, our kindness, our courage, our vulnerability, our humility. And all of the emotional responses that are ours as a result of our commitment to God's shalom. At times we are exhausted. And in our exhaustion, may we remember that love is more than material gifts. And all of our gifts matter to the Holy One.
thou, Holy One. Receive also our gifts of tiredness, mm. kindness, courage, vulnerability, and anger. Mm. All of these things are meant to be for the, for the love that you desire from us. We want to give you both our material gifts and our work to do justice, but the work often feels endless and the results look so small. We truly want to be kind, to be vulnerable, to keep showing up for impossible battles. We ask that our gifts today be a part of our continued commitment to faithfulness in the journey towards your shalom. We dedicate our financial gifts as well as our personal commitment to loving our difficult and complicated neighbor, whom you love as you love us. We present to you our financial gifts as well as our anger, sorrow, fear, and outrage, asking only that you use them for your holy purposes. Amen. into the world, trusting with your hearts the wisdom that God bestows upon all who seek to follow God's will. When called to lead, do so with humility and confidence in God. Be in this world a sign of Jesus' presence. Share compassion with all whom you encounter. Live wisely in God's name and glorify God in all you do. And may the grace, mercy, and wisdom of God be our support, guidance, and strength from this day forward and forevermore. <laughs> 